Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's The Riding Life. I'm Joseph Ross, and our guest today is E. Ethelbert Miller. Ethelbert is a poet. He's my friend. He's the author of several poetry collections, editor of several poetry anthologies, too. Ten years, he's been the co-editor of Poet Lore, America's oldest poetry journal. And many of us poets in the Washington, D.C. area think of him as the dean of D.C. poets. And that's a, that's a title that comes with great affection. So it's very oh, nice so it's to be with to you today. You. Thank you for inviting me. I'm glad you're here, and I'm grateful to the chance to, inter to talk to you and interview you. Um, I and many other people who love poetry are very excited about this upcoming book, The Collected Poems of the Ethelbert Miller, uh, edited by Kirsten Porter. Mm -hmm, correct. Tell us about this process and this new, this new collection. Well, I like to look at this book as Kirsten Porter's book. I mean, because she's edited uh, a 500-page book. She's written a 30-page introduction. Mm. Um, I met her when she was a student at Marymount University. Mm -hmm. you know, today, she's a professor at Marymount University. Oh, nice. Uh, I was on her committee when she was a creative writing student at George Mason. So I've known her for a long time. Um, she's a person who knows my work. Um, but for me, you know, knowing her family and knowing what's happening in terms of American education, in terms of teaching, is many people are trapped as lecturers. Mm -hmm. You know, I see this book as giving, you know, Kirsten visibility on her own campus. Um, she's an excellent scholar, you know. Um, to see that as a gift to her is really what I like, the fact that um, this book is her book as well as my own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to me to think about there being such a, a resource of so many of your poems in one place. Well, it's, it's also important because, you know, it's my collected work. Uh, I think over the years, people pretty much know me as literary activists. Yeah. People know me for the organizations I work for or have headed. Um, the knowledge of my work, I think, for example, is not where I would like it to be. You know, many times I go places, my books are not there. Mm. Um, I've written a second memoir. People haven't read the first memoir, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I think here with my collected poems, uh, it'll be a very good introduction um, to my work. And it comes at a time in which I see myself moving into new areas. Um, mm -hmm. I got my Medicare card now, so I realize <laughs> that, you know, exactly, like, my knees might give out next. But uh, I think to have a body of work that, you know, captures the last 40 years, I think it's good to have it in one place. Yeah. What, what was it like to look back at what, what now would then would be very old poems and then look at also newer poems and things in the middle where you were, your life was in different places. Well, I think even stages. more than that, Joe, you know, is that um, working with Kirsten, what we did is we went over to my archives, which is at, at the Gilman Library at George Washington University. I never really used my archive. You know, I'm always giving GW, you know, boxes. Mm -hmm. But to sit and have them bring out parts of your life in order uh, is really something that um, stops you. You start dealing with your own mortality. You realize mm -hmm. um, sometimes how many people are no longer living. Mm -hmm. You know, you have flyers from people's readings. Um, you have manuscripts that you never publish. Mm -hmm. You know, and what Kirsten did was go through, you know, the early years, the fine poems that I may have written and to totally forgot about. Yeah. You know, and so that was very educational for me in terms of looking back on my life. When you imagine readings, and, I, and obviously you'll do lots of readings in support of this and sharing this work with people, how will you make choices about what to read, do you think, looking at older things and newer things? And well, you know, I think, and I wonder whether you do this, um, many times when we go out for readings, we wind up reading the poems that we the most recent ones that we've written. Yeah. Um, I think now what I able to do, depending on my mood, I can do like an overview, depending on the audience. I could read earlier work. Uh, I think um, going into a school, for example, I can pick out work that might be timely for what's going on in society. Yeah. You know, like right now we have a lot of situations dealing with police brutality. We have a lot of things dealing with the Middle East, you know. Uh, I can now quickly go to that body of work, and it's right there. Um, just the other day, I was looking at, um, how the book was put together. And what I liked about it was I felt I've, re I've written a number of really good poems. You know, I'm not going to be arrogant. <laughs> Glad you recognize that. <laughs> yeah, Lots I mean, of us have known right, that for a long right. time. Well, you know what it is, and I say that because um, Kirsten, what she did in terms of researching, she was looking at so many other collective poems that had been produced by other writers. Oh, I you know, see, to get ideas. Write, to get an yeah, idea. What worked. What and and what works. And so what happens is that um, for me to sit down and go over my work, what I like is the range in terms of style. 
Mm. You know, um, I can see things that are consistent because you're putting it in order. You see the things that begin to jump out at you. Mm -hmm. But I find that being a person around a lot of writers, I like the range of my work. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things that I think will surprise somebody because they'll find out that, oh, I didn't know he wrote poems about that. I didn't know he wrote in that style. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, for example, may not associate me with sonnet and haiku, but they will see that in, in, in the book. A yeah. lot of experimental work. Yeah, you say that that will appear in this collection. Yeah, so there are things there. I feel like I know your work decently, but I'm sure there are things sure. there that are going to surprise right. me and be new to me. Yeah. yeah, and and I think it goes back to one of the things that I in, encourage Kirsten to do. I say, Kirsten, write a very long introduction. Okay, uh, many collective poems have short introduction. She wrote a 30-page introduction to mm. this book, mm -hmm. and so I, I, I'm very happy with that. And then I'm very happy that um, Susanna Heschel um, agreed to, to write the book blurb. And mm -hmm. she doesn't know any blurb books. And people are familiar with her father, Abraham Heschel. Yeah. And um, for her to look at my collection and then sort of connect it to her father's work, I felt really pulled out some of the spiritual mm -hmm. themes mm -hmm. that I had been dealing with in terms of over the last 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. Thinking about, let's talk about process for a minute. It's always fascinating to me. I feel like sometimes for poets, it's a boring question to be asked, but I think people love to hear about how you, how you write. How do you start? How do you finish? What are some of the things that happen in between? So say a little bit about that, but then also looking back over these 40 years of poems, I, I bet that's changed some too? Well, I think my days has changed. I mean, if, if I look <clears> at not just the writing process, but to, to, no pun intended, the writing life, what happens yeah. is that I get up very early. You know, I, people yeah. know I get up with, like, with the monks. And, and what has changed? I spend a lot of time, for example, um, Skyping with my friend Joanna Chen, who's a very important writer. I think people really love her essays that are beginning to appear in a number of publications. She lives in Israel. And so sometimes what happens is that we'll share what other what poems we're reading. Mm -hmm. We're recommending books and titles. I mean, she's affected my work. I've affected hers. I met her a couple of years ago when I was a Fulbright scholar to Israel, and we've maintained that friendship. Mm -hmm. So I use it as an example of how the writer's life has changed just in terms of technology. I can Skype with another writer that's across in another, the world. Across yeah. the world. Okay, that yeah. was not the situation before. Being a literary activist, um, my morning begins with answering a lot of correspondence. You know, I've maintained the fact that if we use email today, email has always been designed for speed. Hmm. If somebody sends me an email and I'm not going to get back to them until next week, put a stamp on it, okay? Mm -hmm. So I make sure that if somebody's contacting me, um, I'm responding. And sometimes it might be somebody working on a project, so I pass on to that. I do a lot of blogging. I've been blogging since 2004. Sometimes in the process of writing something for my blog might come the line for a poem, hmm. okay? It might be something where I'm being funny or whatever, and I say, well, I like this line, mm -hmm. okay? And so what happens then, after finish blogging, I'll go back and maybe begin to flesh that out. Mm -hmm. I write very fast, so it's not a sense in terms of um, um, am I going to think about this for the entire you know, two or three weeks. No, if I write a poem, I'm going to write a poem. Mm -hmm. um, I will probably read it aloud, um, read it even at a reading. I may not really do the actual revision until I'm putting a manuscript together or sending it out for publication. Hmm. Okay. okay. Yeah. So that that's where it, where it, where it begins. But and reading it aloud is always part of your part of that. that I'm always doing that. I mean, I'm always yeah. I'm always composing that. You know, yeah. uh, even when I wrote my memoirs, like Fathering Words, that is meant to be read aloud. You yeah. know, there's passages in there you have to hear. Yeah. And and, and I, I take pride in that. Um, but the process is one when I was single. Um, most of my poems were written when I. Um, you know, got out of the shower. Yeah. But what happens is that um, I, I try to read a lot of poetry, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I say that because I'm doing so many other things in terms of reading, you know, that I have to make sure I make time for reading poetry. Yeah. So let's do that, huh? Uh, How read about, that? yeah. Re read I'll, I'll, read, I'll, read, I'll read you um, this poem called, Is Eric Dolphy Coming or Going? <laughs> it's 12.08, and Frank O'Hara is late for lunch. He often gets lost outside New York. I'm in Starbucks near DuPont Circle, sitting with Billy Strayhorn. Our conversation turns to Pittsburgh, and for a moment, I want to be August Wilson or Roberto Clemente. Billy asked to see my Washington Post. He wants to know what the police are doing these days. Frank arrives, and he looks like Mona Lisa with a smile. Maybe it's the danger that comes with museum work. Eric Dolphy is eating next door, he whispers. At times, Frank can be as difficult as Ashbury. Have they ever met? Imagine all the New York poets moving to New Jersey and never taking the Amtrak to DC. 
Billy hands the newspaper back. It's 12.30, and everyone is in a sentimental mood. We rise and go next door. Dolphy looks up from his plate and says, the food here sucks, but it's better than the music people are playing these days. <laughs> he laughs and tells Frank to keep his day job. Billy tries to be as gracious as Duke. He nods at Dolphy, and the two of them walk outside for a smoke. I think of Dolphy's Out to Lunch album. The clock tells me this man is never coming back. Beautiful. And, you know, in, in there, I try to be very venturesome. Um, anybody who knows the writers, there's a lot of, you know, play on the words. You know, Asbury, the New York poets coming out of New, getting out of New York. Uh, a lot of references to the relationship between Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I like that. My baseball, Roberto Clemente references in there. Mm -hmm. And it's all built around the Eric Dolphy Out to Lunch album cover, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, in the old days, um, if somebody went out for lunch, they put a look clock and went in with us with the with the hands there. We'll be, we'll be back we'll at We'll be back at the yeah. side. And so on the out the lunch album, he has all these little arrows like he's you don't know when he's coming yeah. back. And I and I always um had that image, you know, I mean I think I saw that album cover when I was in college mm -hmm. and it always stuck with me and here years later I write the poem. Mm -hmm. And thinking of you, or the, the location in the poem of the coffee shop. Where well, Starbucks uh, actually there, right? Right, right. right. But, and I, I mean, I feel like I've also been with you and seen you around a zillion tables right. with a zillion cups of coffee. Right, and, right. And, and knowing everybody, you're, one of the great things you give to us is that your world is big. Mm -hmm. Your world is big. Uh, um, at the beginning, I was, I was trying to... Well, can I can I keep track of all these characters who are in this poem? <laughs> Franco Harris. Oh, uh, now I yeah. lost. Them. Yeah, there, and there it was that Franco Harris, right? Yeah. Right, right. The fact yeah. you know the actual times and stuff like that, uh, and then you know there's another line where um, in one of Franco Harris poems, you know, he picks up a, a magazine to see what the poets in West Africa are doing. In this case, I pick up the Washington Post what the police are doing. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And so it's it's the thing where you look at it. Actual titles for composition, sentimental mood. Yeah. So I try to. Um, there's a lot of layers. A lot there. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, Joe. I probably would not have taken this type of risk in my work uh, if I had been reading like work by James Tate. You know, mm. I, I like the high juxtaposition things, you know, it might be absurd at times, but I like that risk and freshness in, in, in poetry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And jazz and baseball, two loves of yours uh, coming together. Oh yeah, definitely, two, definitely, two definitely, definitely baseball. Together. I mean, I always felt I could manage the Nationals better than some people have managed the Nationals, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But, you know, I say that in terms of, um, you know, at this particular point in my life, you know, um, doing my collected poem, um, going out to more baseball games, you yeah. know, going back. And, and what, I, what I realized going back, and this ties with the collected poem, when I go out to the baseball park, I see the older people, you know, the older guys, right? Mm -hmm. And this is why I'm arguing against, why do we want to speed up the game? Yeah. For who? All the young people have watching the game when they're talking on the cell phone. They're not watching the field. They're watching mm -hmm. the scoreboard and everything. The old guys there, why speed it up? Right, they don't want to sped up. They're in yeah. the seventh inning, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, they, they can barely stretch. Right. And, and, and I say that in terms of one, uh, I returned to baseball because it's something that I, that I really appreciate, really love, and really understood. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I'm beginning to say, okay, I like the writing, let me connect the two. Let's move a little bit. So the literary activist, you've described yourself this way, lots of us admire and try to, try to follow sort of what, how you have done that. Uh, and you do that in a million ways. Uh, your work uh, with Poet Lore as the editor of that. Now, for 10 years, that I... Yeah, me and Jody Bowles, you know, I always tell people um, uh, editing a magazine is very important for one's development. Uh, it gets you out of your comfort level. It gets you to appreciate other voices. At the same time, it's a service to the field. Um, what I will always tell people, you know, when I talk about Poet Lore, Jody Bowles is one of the best editors in the country, hmm. you know, uh, and, I, and, I, and I've been around a number of editors. Yeah. And I, I like her ability to remember who she's published, you know, um, but she spends a lot of time. We read all the poems. I mean, yeah. I, didn't, I had no idea when, I, when Al Lefkowitz asked me to come on and, and help edit this magazine with Rich Cannon and other people, Gene Nordhaus. Uh, I didn't know how much work it is, mm -hmm. okay? We are the oldest publication. We have poetry in our title. So many times when people are looking about, you know, where should I send work to, yeah. they Google and well, Poet Law comes up. And so we get a lot of work. One person I'm happy we published because I think we affected that person's life is Dwayne Betts. Mm -hmm. um, we published one of his poems when he was incarcerated in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Dwayne Betts is finishing up his law degree at Yale University. It's a new collection of poems coming out. And a couple of other collections right. that are beautiful poems. Right, yeah. and, and he'll, he'll tell you that when... Um, he received the acceptance. He just ran around and everybody was happy for him. Mm. And, and 
I say that in terms of what Jody and I do. We read all the work. Yeah. You know, many times what happens, someone will see an envelope come in and, you know, it's from a person who's incarcerated, you know, maybe the letters is addressed a certain way, the poems are handwritten, and if you don't take time and find a gem and stuff like that, if you just discard it, uh, you're not doing your job as an editor. Yeah. You're not really looking at what the magazine can represent. Uh, one of the things I'm doing now is I go and I target many well-known writers, okay? because I want that person who appears in Poet Law, but it might be their first publication, I want them to flip that magazine over and see their name next to Pinsky or Hoagland or whoever and say, wow, you know, look, what, I'm in a magazine with these other individuals. Yes, yeah. And you'd be surprised when you, just like fundraising, if you ask somebody like for a poem, they say, oh yeah, I've got a poem. And so um, by doing that, we made sure that the magazine will always have a certain level. We have guest editors which means that you know they will introduce writers. That means that we can look at our magazine, Jody and I, and realize that our voices are not going to always shape it. We'll have a guest editor, mm -hmm. somebody living in another part of the country, who will bring a new, fresh voice you know, to our publication. Yeah, yeah. Other parts of your, your sort of life and role as literary activists kind of, you know, are, I feel like they're very rooted in Washington, D.C. in some ways. Uh, very rooted to the city and the curbs and the sidewalks <laughs> well, <laughs> and others things then yeah. big like Library right. of Congress. And well, you know, I, I take pride in, in if and my friend Michelle Boston has, has done this. Uh, if someone goes around D.C. now, I think my face or my work is about maybe 15 places. Yeah, that's you know, right. Um, we were sort of joking about whether my face would be erased from the bookstore um, mural that's, that's up there at Howard University. Uh, <laughs> is it still there? <laughs> it's, it's still there. The mural's still there. I, 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 check, I check every now and then. But what happens is that, you know, I take pride in that because this is a city that I made my home. Yeah. Um, this is a city that, <clears throat> you know, when I, I, I look at, the Sterling Browns and the Owen Dots and the, the rise that came before me, um, it's, it's, it's an honor to, to be part of that tradition. Yeah. The location I think that I, I find uh, is most dear to me, at least, is the poem, uh, your poem at, near the DuPont Circle Metro around the tree right. uh, about those right. that we lost. Well, that, yeah, that's a very, very, very important poem for me. And you asked about the process. And to many people. Right. Yeah. And I, I would not have written that poem. Um, Joe, if I, if I had not known um, Jason Gaver, if I had not known Essex Hemphill, mm -hmm. you know, I had, to, I had to write the poem beginning with people who I had lost as, in terms of friends. Yeah. Uh, I, had to, I had to build that way. Um, Jason Gaver was a person I didn't know well, but he was a person that was the first person to respond to the idea of building this literary archives over at the Gilman Library. He made mm -hmm. the first donation. Mm -hmm. And that showed you the importance of literary uh, act, uh, activists, that many times what happens, you have to be concerned about preservation. Yeah. You know, I try to make sure that certain names are not forgotten. Yeah. You know, whether it's Amazu Bolton or Gaston Neal, you know, and that's just DC. Yeah. Um, too often when we deal with literary history, uh, we have a sense of overlooking a lot of people who if more attention would be given to, uh, we would see that they're major voices and not minor voices. Yeah. And I remember years ago when you, f may, I think it might have been when you first began to get your, give your stuff to GW and the Gelman Library, I remember thinking, wow, I never even thought about how somebody would, would do that process. And it was always interesting to hear you talking about taking another box or, you know, right. sorting through things and deciding what would go there. And, right. um, what, say more about that kind of what's well keep in mind if, if you go to the Gelman collection I think what makes my collection different from somebody else it's not just about me yeah you know back in the late 60s early 70s and this is a true story you know I got this idea from J. Edgar Hoover you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know that I would keep tabs and, and, and files and all the rights I knew and I tell you over the years what happened is that I had friends uh, who had fires in their homes, lost a lot mm -hmm. of their work, lost manuscript and I was able to you know give them back things that they had um, there's a number of people who I've collected their work for so many years. In fact, one project that I've been trying to find somebody to do work on, I have in my archives five major African American critics who are prominent now. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for a scholar to go and go over and look at their development. Many times we, do, we, we talk about the various writers, but let's look at five major critics and mm. how they started out. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think there's a body of work there that's waiting to be, to be looked at. Read another poem to us. I'll read a short one. Okay. Um, and this is, uh, I mean, I'll just read it and I'll show you how it's put together. Oh, those silver bullets. Paul Dunbar wants to know how the Lone Ranger got his mask. 
Claude McKay once said, if we must die, let it be for love or a French kiss outside Paris. Langston knew the heart was a big C, and the blues nothing but a renaissance of sadness. Hmm. That's a short poem. Mm -hmm. You're teaching African American Lit class. What do we see here? We wear the mask, mm -hmm. Dunbar's signature poem, mm -hmm. take off on popular culture with the Lone Ranger, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's another thing about how he got his mask. Mm -hmm. uh, Claude, must, Claude McKay, If We Must Die, very important poem. Yeah. So I have that in there. Langston Hughes, his first memoir is called The Big C, mm -hmm. associated with blues, also associated with the Harlem Renaissance. So the whole thing of the blues, nothing but a renaissance of sadness. Mm. Now, for me as a writer, what do I like? I love Claude McKay once said, if we must die, let it be for love. We're a French kiss outside Paris. I love that, you mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. And talk about baseball, um, everyone now is criticizing the bat flip. Mm -hmm. You know, you're mm -hmm. just supposed to hit your home run and put the bat down and <laughs> like it's tea time <laughs> right. and run around the bases quickly without it. But what happens now is they're saying, well, okay, we got people coming in from different countries and this and that. And what happens, it's, it's an art form. Mm -hmm. and, and what happens now, it's going to be a question to see whether players are penalized, just like how in football there was antics the, and the, the dance, the, the dance and, and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, after one of his last plays, you know, we saw it, I said, you know, that's how I want to feel when I write a poem. You know, like, you know, you just like, <laughs> you, know, you spike right. it on the, you know, you take it out and you spike it, you know? Right. And, and, and this is the thing where um, the technology is changing. I, I've, I've yet to do a reading where I'm holding, like, you know, my poem, like I'm reading it off, you know. I think I'd have a heart attack. I, 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 you know, <laughs> right, yeah, I mean, there's things like that that, to me, I, I'm going to be old-fashioned. But this poem, Those Silver Bullets, I like because in a short way, you know, I'm keeping Dunbar, McKay, Langston's, you know, life, and, and the connection, you yeah. know. And I was just coming across in Langston Hughes' letters. I didn't know that Langston and Claude McKay were going to do a book together. Oh, my gosh, yeah. really? You know, it was just a, a thing. A book that, of? Like poetry, but, you know, oh. just, you know, I mean, I was, it's just amazing the things that you can find in letters and stuff, projects that never were developed. Right. Okay, and, and so in my short poem, I connect them, you know, and, and Dunbar's key because he sort of opens a door for African-American poets. Yeah, you yeah. Know? So uh, I think the poem works on that, that yeah, level. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, you've recently taught a class on memoir. Uh, yeah, taught at the University of Houston. Victoria, right. How do memoir and your poetry, these two genres, how do, how do they talk to each other? Well, for me, I, I would have never written um, Fathering Words if, yeah. if I had not lost my, my brother and my, and my father, you know. So when I look at, at um, Fathering Words, that comes out of grief, that comes out of mourning, that comes out of how do I testify and give witness that my father, my brother, lived. Mm -hmm. um, my father surprised the family by um, asking to be cremated. Hmm. You know, that, never, that never happened. <laughs> you know, you know. And wasn't talked about in advance. <laughs> we were not talking about it. But to, to, to stand in, in a cemetery in, in Yonkers and have my father be reduced to a small box, mm -hmm. I, I said, I, that, that just hit me. I said, that my, I have to do what writers can do. I can give witness to my father's life. I can do what writers do. I can make my father, who was a working class man, I can make his life heroic. Mm -hmm. and, and I felt that was my, my, my um, using my gift, my talents. Mm -hmm. And when I go into a classroom today, this is, the book came out in 2000, it's 2015 now, people are still talking about my, my father, my mother, I've kept, I kept them alive. This mm -hmm. is what literature can do, mm -hmm. you know? And um, we, we, we deal with this battle against erasure. Mm -hmm. or, 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 and, and memory is extremely important. It has a lot to identifying ourselves. And you use your life as an example, hopefully, to encourage others. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I tell people the difference between my two memoirs is that in Fathering Words, I'm mapping my life, you know, the landscape. In the fifth inning, I'm mining. I'm going mm -hmm. deeper. I'm bringing things to light that perhaps people say was, you know, was, was, was challenging or controversial. Mm -hmm. But I wanted, sometimes you have to do that deep, that deep, um, deeping. Yeah, um, digging to in order to heal oneself. Yes, and so I felt the second memoir was 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 uh, essential for me to write. And I wonder, it strikes me, if you had to do the breadth work of fathering words before you could do the the depth of the fifth inning. Well, that has a lot to do with. I think you, if you're going to dig, you want to know what the train is. Yeah, right. Know? I mean, right and, now, and where do you dig? Right, well, right now, for example, you look at how we're uh, deal, we're approaching the whole thing of, of of the North Pole. I mean, you know, the Arctic area, where all of a sudden you you you, you see more. Um, land being exposed, but it's not necessarily this oil or, or secrets or stuff down there. Yes. You're going to have to see the land and then go and dig. Yeah. You yeah. know, and then that requires assistance. You don't want to get trapped in the mine. Yeah. And keep in mind the key thing here is that you're bringing hopefully something to light. Yeah. 
We're in this moment now of Black Lives Matter. Uh, we were talking on the way here. Maybe it's not, it's not a new moment, actually. But the way we're talking about it, at least in the broadness of the culture, sort of feels like it. Well, I think what happens, you know, we could be two little Whitman sitting here. You know, America's always been an experiment, you yeah. know. I think now with the technology, we realize how close we are. Um, together. Uh, some of the things that we see taking place is always taking place. Yeah. We just never had the evidence. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you go back and look at the various race riots and things of that sort, there was always some sort of altercation, you know, and, and it was always violent. I think what has happened over the years is that we keep saying, okay, we want to have this dialogue on race, blah, 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 blah. We've been having it, mm -hmm. okay? And what happens is that when you go out here and travel around the country, you see people changing. And what's the, what's the evidence? African Americans are not just responsible for Obama being in the White House. I mean, mm -hmm. if every black person, and, and they all didn't vote, right. <laughs> right? Right. If, there's no way they collect them. So it's obvious that twice, see, twice, not like Sally Field, like when he won Oscar, you know, yeah. twice they voted for Obama. And think of what that meant in certain families, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's take the Cuban households, like say in Florida. All of a sudden, you've got a grandchild telling a grandfather, this grand no, I'm, I'm voting for Obama. Yeah. You know, and, and, and the grandfather can't get past the fact that, well, but he likes Fidel, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and, and what does it mean in that family? Generational stuff. Yeah. And, right, and, and difficult. Yes. Very difficult. And I imagine that many people never said who they voted for. Yeah. You see? Interesting. And, and, and in fact, I go back to the Republican convention when Sarah Palin came on the scene. You remember how the media spun that? Mm -hmm. That Sarah Palin electrified the media, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. You go back and look at that footage. She didn't electrify that convention hall. You look closely, there are a number of conservative white guys, Ivy League types, who are sitting there and they're saying, I think this woman is an idiot. At the end of the day, I'm voting for the black guy from Harvard. <laughs> you know what I mean? You yeah. know, the yeah. class interest or whatever. Yeah. You know, and that's the type of time where we live in. And, yeah. and um, it's a challenge now. Yeah. But yes. I think that when we look at the Black Lives Matter, we're seeing young people, another generation, you know, who hopefully want the best for this country. Yeah. But I think the dialogue is going out here and, and that's what gives me hope. Yeah. And on that note, we have to bring our conversation to an end. So Ethelbert, thank you very much. Oh, thank you for inviting me. It's been great to talk with you. This has been Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. I'm Joseph Ross. Our guest today has been poet E. Ethelbert Miller. <laughs> Thank you.